Good evening, my beloved. I am so excited to be with you again this week as we close up our series on worship. I've had an exciting time working, uh, teaching this lesson, and I truly hope that you have enjoyed uh, learning the difference between praise and worship. So, uh, but our main focus is on worship and to share with you the importance of worshiping God. And so that's our intent tonight, is to come before you with our last session on the series on worship. So let us start by invoking the presence of the Holy God into our midst tonight. Father God, we praise and honor you and we thank you for this opportunity again, Lord, to come before your people and to thank, give you thanks and glory for who you are. Pray, O oh God, that as you go, we go through this study that you will open up our hearts and our minds and that we will only impart those things that the Holy Spirit give to us. Pray that we will have listening ears and open hearts to receive this lesson, God, as we only want to do things that please you. Bless the word as it goes forth. Bless the hearers. Bless the homes that are represented in the audience tonight. And we would all, always be willing and so grateful to be able to give you praise. And thank you for all you've done in the past. Thank you for what you're doing now. Thank you for what you will be doing in the future. We praise you and we bless your holy name. And we thank you and give it all to you and ask it in the name of Jesus. And may you be glorified by what transpires here tonight. To God be the glory. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Okay, by way of explanation of, of uh, review, in our first lesson on uh, worship, uh, we shared with you the difference between praise and worship. Uh, praise, uh, we learned, is usually visible. You can see and hear people when they praise. Uh, and uh, worship is more intimate. You don't always see or hear worship, but praise is always visible and very vocal, so you can hear praise. Uh, and certain, uh, even creation, another major difference is even creation can praise God. The, the trees praise Him, the wind. And, and we, have, we have the account in Luke 19 when the uh, people were asking Jesus to quieten down the crowd. And Jesus told them that if these people don't uh, praise me, even the rocks will cry out. So you don't have to have a relationship with God or know God personally. I mean, uh, to, to praise God. Praise is not personal the way worship is. Uh, because worship does not take place apart from a relationship with God. Worship does not take place apart from a relationship with God because it comes from the heart of God and from us and it flows out of a relationship with God and involves the Holy Spirit. So that was our first lesson. Then the second lesson we talked about the essence of worship and that word essence means the ultimate nature of something. And so we, are, we learned that worship is not just limited to this feeling of the presence of God that you experience in a church service, but that true worshipers can worship God even in the midst of emotionally de devastating situations. And we gave you examples of J Abraham when God asked him to sacrifice Isaac. And in fact, Abraham, in the midst of all that, he worshiped God. And you find that in Genesis 22, 5, 22 5. And then Job, we all know the account of Job, how he lost everything. But again, in Job 1.20, Job worships God. And then again in Job in 13.15, Job in he says, Though he slay me, yet will I trust him. So in the midst of losing everything, Job worshipped God. And then David, uh, on the death of his baby by Bathsheba, when the baby died, the scripture tells us in 2 Samuel 12.20 that David got up and washed himself up and worshipped God. So even in the midst of tragedies, True worship can come forth because it comes from a place in your heart uh, that that dictates your love for God, and it's not it's not dictated by circumstances. Amen. And, and and as a matter of fact, worship is a lifestyle. It's a lifestyle, and we talked about the two different types of worship. We talked about the broad worship, which is your lifestyle, and then we talked about the narrow worship, which talks about people being assembled together to meet with God. And so those were the two lessons that we shared with you before. And now we're ending our lesson with our series on worship with becoming a worshiper. Now let me say from the very beginning, there is no model of pattern 
for worship. It is not, it's not a set. You do A points, A, B, C, and D. It's not like that because it comes from the inside and the heart. It's real. It's, it's, it's intentional. It's, it's, it's not uh, something that we make up. It just happens. Worship happens because it flows out of your spirit and your love for God. And so we know from Jesus' own words that God seeks people to worship him. And we'll find that in John 4, 23. And uh, I'll just get, make a note of it, and you can just look it up at your own time. But one of the most uh, uh, outstanding examples of a worshiper is a story, I, I believe it is, is the story of the sinful woman who anointed the feet of Jesus. And you'll find her story in Luke chapter 7, verses 36 through 50. Because I believe she demonstrates what characterizes worship, true worship. It wasn't set. There was no set pattern. It wasn't something that, they, that she decided, I'm going to go do this. It just happened. It just happened. And just to briefly bring you up to date on her story, there was a Pharisee who invited Jesus to his house to have dinner. And this woman who was known as a, a woman of the city, and the scripture records that she was a sinner, she knew that Jesus would be there. So she went to this place and she went in and she began to wash Jesus' feet with her tears and dry them with her hair. And then the Pharisees that saw it, they became indignant and said, don't Jesus know who this woman is that's touching him? If he knew that, if he let her touch him, then he's not really a prophet. So Jesus then, knowing what they were thinking, gave a parable. And this is the parable I'm going to share with you uh, because I don't want you to miss it. Uh, and Jesus answered and said to him, Simon, I have something to say to you. He said, so on, say on, teacher. There was a certain creditor who had two debtors. One owed him 500 denarii and the other 50. And when they had nothing with, with which to repay, he freely forgave both of them. Tell me, therefore, which one of them would love him more? Simon answered and said, I suppose it would be the one who forgave, he forgave more. And Jesus said to him, you have rightly judged. Then he turned to the woman and said to Simon, Do you see this woman? I entered your house. You gave me no water for my feet, but she has washed my feet with her tears and wiped them with her hair on her head. You gave me no kiss, but this woman has not ceased to kiss my feet since the time I came in. You did not anoint my head with oil, but this woman has anointed my feet with fragrant oil. Therefore I say to you, her sins, which are many, are forgiven. For she loved much, but to whom little is forgiven, the same loves little. Then he said to her, your sins are forgiven. And it ends by saying, your faith has saved you. Go in peace. And so my point is, she worshipped God since out of the sincerity of her heart. She just wanted to worship him. And in her worship, she showed honest adoration. And that's what worship entails. It's honest adoration. It wasn't about her. It wasn't about her seeking anything. She just honestly adored Jesus. And then she showed humility to come into a place where you know you are not welcome. And you know there was a situation with women and men back in those days. But she showed humility. She knew she would be uh, uh, disregarded, you know, but she didn't care. She humbled herself and went anyway. And then she showed her love for Jesus. It wasn't just talk. She demonstrated the love she had for God. And then lastly, she gave Jesus her all. She gave him her absolute all. And so there are some lessons that we learn from this woman. Now, this is not necessarily all the lessons, but I want to share a few of them with you that we can learn about worship just from this text of this woman. First of all, the first lesson we learn from this woman is that worshipers are givers. When you are a worshiper, you don't have a problem paying your tithes and offering. Let me say that again. When you are a worshiper, you don't have a problem paying your tithes and offering. And, and tithing and, and offering time is also a part of worship. It's a part, and most pe people will say, pastors and ministers will say that now we reached a point in this service where everybody can participate. You're still in worship service, but it's not it's not the praise and the shouting. There are some churches who when they do an offering, they include praise because it's an act of giving God all, giving God you. And even if you uh, there's an account of a widow's might where the rich people came and 
dropped their coins in because they had it to give. But there was this one widow who had one mite, and she gave that all she had. And Jesus made a statement that she has given more than anybody because she gave all she had. So a worship, an act of worship then is giving something to God. It's giving him whatever you have to give. And it's particularly important to understand that when you worship God with your whole heart and soul, you don't have a problem following his, um, his, his uh, announcement about bringing all the tithes to the storehouse and giving God a tenth. That's part of worship. That is part of worship. But in, no, matter, no matter what you give, 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 give something to God. Because again, when it's time to lift the offering, that is still worship. We don't take a recess or take a break and do offering. No, it is still worship. And she, this woman, in the form of her worship, she gave all she had. All she had. Amen. And then the very essence of worship is self-abasement and humility. And worship is the humbling of self and the exalting of God. And that's exactly what this woman showed. She showed humility, as I said, to even venture into that room where she knew she was not going to be welcomed where she knew she would be looked down upon. She didn't think about herself. She had no, no thought of, of her and what would happen to her. All she showed in her act was that Jesus is here. I love him and I want to demonstrate my love to him. And we'll see as we go on uh, in the study of, of, um, of, of, of love that love is an action. And so she acted out of love for God for Jesus to, to go in there and humble herself and show humility. And she exalted him by washing his feet with her tears and drying them with her hair. And she humbled herself and kissed his feet. So if that's not humility, if that's not worship, I don't know what is. And so we learn from her again that in, in, in worship, it's not about you. Worship is not about you. It's not about what God has done for you. It's about God and who he is, his, his excellence, his sovereignty, everything about him. When you exalt God because you're so in love with him and all you want to say and is release what's in your heart, that I love God. I worship him because of who he is, because of who he is. And she did exactly that. She did exactly that. And again, it shows by her going to this house, it proves to us that the church is not the only place where worship takes place. Worship takes place every day in our lives by in and through what we all do. There's a form of worship in what we do. When we're kind to people, that's a form of worship. And so this woman sought Jesus out while he was at dinner in somebody's house, which again lets us know that um, worship is, does not, is not limited to a church building. And many people think that the only place you can worship God is there. But I share something with you. True worship is private time. When you, well, a form of true worship, I should say, is when you are alone with God. It could be in your house. It could be in your car. I have a friend of mine who used to take her lunch breaks in her car. And she said that was her time to really worship God. She shut out everything that was around her, and she would spend her lunchtime in her car worshiping God. So it, don't, don't get it in your mind that worship is limited to a church. No, wherever you find a place that, the, for me, it's in my office when I shut the doors and there's nobody in, in, here, in there but me and Jesus. It, it's, it's private, it's personal, and you can go, get, go all out in your love for God and expressing your love for him. So just keep in mind that uh, you don't have to be uh, limited to Sunday or whatever day you show up at church. You can worship God uh, in and through your lifestyle because we're going to find out that worship is a lifestyle. It's how you live. It's how you treat people. All of that is included because you love God because worship is love. And as you treat people right, you're showing God, you're showing God who you are. You're humbling yourself. You, you're reaching out to other people. That's love and that's showing God that I love you. I'm doing this because I love you. Amen. And so, uh, and we have to understand that, um, these are just some examples in this particular passage of scripture. Uh, and it's not meant, to, uh, again, it's not meant to confine worship to these acts only. 
you know, because there is no formula for worship. I want you to understand that clearly. There is no formula for worship because worship is a function of the heart. It's what you're feeling on the inside. That's what worship is. And so, and the heart will find different ways to express your love for God. For some people, it's singing. There are people who get wrapped up in, in singing and worshiping God and adoring God. And I certainly do miss those songs that we sang when I was a youngster several years ago. Uh, they were worship songs, and they basically talked about God and how good he was and uh, just, just the goodness of God and how much they loved God. So they were kind of different from what we hear today in our more contemporary music. But I love worship songs. And if you have a hymnal in your possession, you can go through and find hundreds of songs that are just worshiping God. So you can worship God in, in just by singing about your love to him. You can worship God in your prayer time. When you get ready to pray, and part of your prayer, or all of your prayer actually, is about him and his goodness and his love. And, and uh, he saved you, just, just adoring him. So worship comes also in the form of prayer, in the form of prayer. So there's, there's, there's singing, there's prayer, and then there's just simply silent time alone when you give yourself time to listen for the voice of God. That's worship. Because you're, you're, it's, it's the desire to do that is coming strictly out of your heart. Because your desire is towards him and you want to hear from him. And so you isolate yourself and you find some special time. And you, and you, you let your friends know, of course, this is my time with God. Don't call me. Don't text me. Just, just respect me enough to give me this time along with God. Because this is my time to worship God. And I, I particularly love... Uh, and this is no, like I said, there's no formula and there's no special posture in worshiping God. But I like to worship God on my knees because it shows it to me. I'm not saying you have to do that. But for me, it's a sign of humility. Um, quick testimony. In, in 2020, I had a very bad uh, illness and very, very bad. It, it, uh, it almost cost my life. And I was at a point where I could not do anything for myself. And I had to be helped in the bed, helped out of bed. Just I couldn't do anything. And at about two months after I got word from God that He was He was healing me, I got I was laying in bed. I was getting ready for bed actually. By then I was able to get in and out by myself. And I was getting ready to get in the bed so I could pray. And the Spirit told me, "Get on your knees." Now prior to that, for the last four months, four or five months, I had not been able. To get on my knees and for me to get on my knees was you thought i won the lottery i mean i was just excited that i was at a point in my healing process where i could go back to praying and worshiping god on my knees now i'm not saying you have to be on your knees hear me clearly but for me so i would suggest to you find something that works for you in your worship time with God, in your alone time with God, when you're not disturbed. That's how you hear from God. That's how you hear uh, in your spirit Him speaking to you. Quite often it's doing your, uh, your worship time with Him when you just want to adore Him and acknowledge who He is and acknowledge His goodness and His perfection and all those things. Amen? And becoming a worshiper is a privilege. It is a privilege and a challenge. It's the one thing that delights God's heart above all else when we worship him. And matter of fact, getting back to John's gospel, he said that the time, let me go back there. John ch chapter 4, just bear with me a second. John chapter 4, because that was one of our main scriptures in this lesson. And I will go back there and read some of that. Um, and I'm going to read verse number 23. It says, Jesus 4, John 4, 23. Uh, you worship what you do not know. We know what we worship, for salvation is of the Jews. 23, but the hour is coming, and now is, when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. For the Father is seeking such to worship him. God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship in spirit and in truth. And so, um, 
uh, it delights God's heart above all else when we worship him. And the word says God is seeking such to worship him. God gets delight when we worship him. And I, I, I compare it to prayer to your children. If um, your only contact with your kids was when they were asking you for something, you'd be kind of say, well, they don't even know me until they ask for something. But if they just come to you and tell you that they love you just out of the blue, that means so much because it's nothing's connected to it except their heart. It's from their heart to yours. And so we can choose to become worshipers. It's a privilege. We choose to become worshipers that God wants us to be. And we do that. One of the ways that part of the process that we do it is we surrender our wills to his will. And we, when we do that, he will make us into worshipers who are prepared to move with God. So when God moves, you move. And that's how it works when you are worshiping. So finding time along with Jesus, honoring him because of who he is, not all the things he's done. That's good. And we praise God for everything he's ever done. The song says, when I look back over my life and I think things over, I can truly say that I've been blessed. I've got a testimony. Your testimony of praise relates to all the things God has done, all the things he's taken you through. Even when things were not looking good, you knew when, if you loved God, God was there because he said, I will never leave you or forsake you. So he's always with you. He carries you through your balance, as David wrote in Psalm 23. So when you start praising God, you vocalize how, how much you desire to be with him and how much you desire uh, to give him word and praise for all the things he's done. But in worship, in worship, you're speaking from your heart with your true feelings uh, about who he is. He's sovereign. He's more than enough. He's all sufficient. He's love. And Bible says God is love. And so, you, you, and all of that comes out of a heart that's in a relationship with God. And that's why I said earlier that worship uh, is predicated upon your relationship with God. And so it comes out of your heart and your true feelings. And it's not related to good times as we showed you in our example last week when we gave the samples of David and Job and, and uh, Abraham. Because each one of those uh, patriarchs, they were in, it was in the most difficult times in their lives. And yet the Bible records in word that they worship God. So worshiping God isn't limited to the good times, even in the bad times. And when times you don't know where your next piece of bread is going to come from, you can still worship God. You still worship him because he doesn't change. So just because you're going through a situation does not mean that God has left or changed or he no longer cares for you. He does. He does. So what we learn to do is to worship him just because of who he is in any occasion, any occasion. And so in closing, I'd like to again point out that worship is not predicated upon what God has done for you, but simply because of who he is. I want us to always remember that and to look back over your life and to just sometimes get in the habit when you look back over your life and you see what he's done and you praise him for that. And then you find some quiet time, time when you can be alone with God, time when you can share your heart with God, time when you can adore him and just tell him how much you love him. Tell him how much you need him. Tell him how much you desire his presence. Tell him how wonderful he is because God is good. He's all that we need in our lives. And in light of what has happened in our nation lately, um, worship is so needed. Worship is so needed because in the midst of what we're seeing, the shootings and the murders and things, we can't lose focus on the goodness of God in spite of what we're experiencing. You just want to worship him anyway. Worship him in, 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 in spite of what you see and hear on the news. You still worship God because God hasn't changed. God hasn't changed. Many times we don't know the purpose of what we're seeing. We don't know, but God has a plan. And we just worship him because of who he is. He's sovereign. He's all-knowing. He's all-sufficient. He's, uh, he's, he's, he's omnipotent. He's omnipresent. He's just everywhere at all times. And no matter what you're going through in your life, 
you can worship God. And when you worship God through your circumstances, through your circumstances that are not good, you, there's a strength that comes to you just because you know I'm not, it's not predicated upon uh, I'm expecting this from you. I just love you anyway, God, and I'll worship you. So remember, um, worship him simply because of who he is and know that there's always a reason to worship God. He woke me up this morning, worship. He's an all-knowing God, worship. He's all-sufficient, worship. He'll never turn his back on us, worship. So, uh, the, uh, Psalmist wrote, I will look to the hills from whence cometh my help. My help comes from the Lord. And so just know that when you worship God, you concentrate on who he is. And just know that God is seeking us to worship him. We just read it in our scripture. The Father is seeking such to worship him in spirit and in truth. So that's our lesson on worship. I hope you enjoyed it. Um, I, 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 I so enjoyed putting it together for us. But I, And I don't want you to go away thinking that worship is more important than, than, than praise. It's not. It's more personal. Therein is the difference. Worship is more personal than praise. Because, again, we can see uh, throughout the, the scriptures that, in, that the nature praises God. But nature, nature doesn't have a relationship with God. And so worship requires a relationship with God through Jesus Christ. So that's our lesson for tonight. And again, I hope you enjoyed it. And again, if you have any questions, you can email us at Livingstone Bible Study. Bible Study at Livingstone. I'm sorry, get it right. Bible Study at Livingstone. Uh, and we would be happy to, um, to uh, entertain your comments and your questions. And I solicit your prayers as we go through this summer and pray that uh, God will give us the wherewithal to understand who he is in spite of what we're seeing on the news. Because just this week alone, we saw some devastating things. And um, it, the Spirit has led me to do a lesson on love, which will be our next lesson next week. I hope you tune in. And get, have your Bibles ready because you know we'll have some scriptures and we want you to follow those scriptures because we want to talk about real love, not, not the movie kind, uh, the, you know, because everybody's in love in the movies. We want to talk about real love. And in the times that we're in now, we need to know what real love looks like. Amen. And God's will for all of us as his children, what does God require of us? As, as far as love is concerned. So that's our series. It's gonna, we're not going to do a series. We're going to have one lesson. So call your friends and get them together for next Wednesday when we come together and we will do a lesson on uh, when love abounds. That's going to be the title of our lesson. And I so look forward to seeing you next week. I solicit your prayers for us and for our church family, the Livingstone Cathedral of Worship. And so until next time, you be blessed and let us pray. Father God, I thank you again for this time we spent together. Thank you, Lord, for allowing us to give a brief commentary on worship and how important worship is. Praise is, is important to God. We don't want to minimize it. Praise is important. Worship is important. There's a difference, but God, they sto they're both so important. So we want us to learn how to praise, but also learn how to worship. And we thank you for the awesome privilege. Bless us now, we pray, and we ask it all in Jesus' name. Amen. Good night.